most valuable commodity I know of is information. Wouldn't you agree? The title of this session is Doubling Your Brain Power, and this is perhaps the most exciting session that we've had the opportunity to talk about, and it's based on our understanding and based on our discovery that every human being is born as a genius. Every single one of us has enormous, untapped reserves of creativity, which we habitually fail to use. And the purpose of this session is to explain to you some of the aspects of your own creativity and show you how to get far, far more out of yourself. We know that in terms of goal setting, in terms of planning for the future, in terms of our aspirations for our income and the things that we want to accomplish, that we can never have any more than we have today simply by sweating harder. The old days where the basic rule was that you worked harder and harder and you hammered away and if you weren't getting results, what you did is you worked harder still, have been passed over and today we know that we live in a totally creative world and that everything that we have today is as a result of the efficiency with which we use our minds. We mentioned this before, and that everything that we have tomorrow is going to be as a result of how we use our creative capacity. The amount of creativity we use is very closely connected to our self-concept and to our attitudes toward ourselves as creative persons. Every child is born with remarkable aspects of creativity. As a matter of fact, in some of the studies they've looked at, they find that 95% of children tested between the ages of 2 and 4 test out as highly creative. Highly creative in that they are imaginative, they're innovative, they're curious, they have tremendous capacities for abstract reasoning and for creating imaginary images. Testing the same children at the age of 7 years, they test out at only 4% creative. In the period between the early years and age 7, Children are continually discouraged over and over again from being creative and innovative and letting their imaginations run rampant. Children are continually told that that's foolish or that's silly or you have to color between the lines or don't touch that, smell that, taste this, get into that. And children gradually learn at a deep subconscious level that it's not smart to get off of the beaten track. It's not smart to try to look or touch or taste or feel things that mommy and daddy don't approve of. The wonderful thing about creativity is that it's subject to another law which we call the law of use. The law of use simply says that with any human faculty, we either use it or lose it. The creative faculty, however, is never totally lost. What happens is that it goes underground and becomes a latent talent or capability of the human mind, and that we can begin to use our creativity again any time in life that we so decide. The purpose of this course is to show us how to trigger it, how to stimulate it, and how to get far more out of it. As a matter of fact, it's been said that necessity is the mother of invention, and if that's so, then creativity is the father. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that we live in the lap of an immense intelligence, and he described this immense intelligence as though it were an ether that surrounded the earth, like a huge mainframe computer into which every one of us can tap. This has been called throughout all of history things like the oversoul or infinite intelligence or the universal subconscious mind or the collective unconscious and we are going to talk about this aspect of human creativity as the superconscious mind this superconscious mind is so much vaster than our own individual intelligence and it is something that we use on a random and haphazard basis all the time if you've ever had the experience of being working on a problem or trying to achieve a goal or being wrestling with some dilemma and as you're walking along or driving along an idea shoots into your mind like a bolt and it's a perfect idea or have you ever had the example for instance where you have been thinking about someone and they telephone you and the phone rings and it's them or you've called someone else and they say I was just thinking about you just when you telephoned we have examples of this all the time where we have these almost unearthly bolts from the blue that seem to indicate that we have the ability to tap into a different form of intelligence than anything that is taught in the textbooks. And the purpose of this session is to explain how this works because by using this superconscious capability we find that we can dramatically improve the quality of our results and move faster toward the achievement of our goals than by using any other human faculty. There's a book by Richard Buck called Cosmic Consciousness where Buck goes back over several hundred years of the most creative men and women of all time and finds that virtually every single one of them 
spoke about in their writings of an ability to tap into a higher form of consciousness. This superconscious mind is characterized by some of the following things. First of all, it's the source of all pure creativity. All great creative geniuses, all great innovations, all major breakthroughs in human history have come as the result of superconscious functioning. Some of the people who have written about using the superconscious function are, for instance, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson said that he never wrote anything of his own volition, but he just simply acted as a conduit for this oversoul or this infinite intelligence, and it would pour through him, and the words would flow out onto paper, word perfect, come through his brain almost as if he were tapped into an unearthly power source. Mozart, for instance, considered the greatest musician of all time, wrote his music note perfect the first time. When he sat down to write, he said the entire music, the entire symphony, the entire opus would come into his mind and he would simply transcribe it onto paper. And people who have read Mozart's music, even at the time he was writing, said it was the most beautiful music ever written down on paper. And he wrote it without corrections, without changes, note perfect the very first time. Beethoven was deaf from the age of 35. Most of his great works were written after he was totally deaf. And Beethoven also said that the symphonies came full-blown into his mind and he simply transcribed them on paper. Edison, the greatest inventor of the modern age, used this superconscious capability over and over again to tap into a higher power and used it for coming up with inventions and insights and so on. Michael Faraday considered the father of electromagnetic field theory an uneducated man who had tremendous abilities to use this superconscious capability and pioneered the work that led to the development of the vacuum tube by de Forest, which led to the radio industry, the television industry, the electronic industry, the transistor, microelectronics, the microelectronic chip, the entire set of principles came to him in a dream and he got up in the middle of the night and he sat down and he wrote page after page after page of scientific formulations which later when taken down to the laboratory and tested were found to be absolutely perfectly precise and brand new in all of human history they had never been written or discovered or worked out before every one of us has had the occasion of using this superconscious creativity where we're going through our day-to-day -day lives and we see a product or a service that we think should be used or think that somebody should be producing and we say I wonder why somebody doesn't offer that or I wonder why somebody doesn't invent that and then two or three or four years later we see a major corporation comes out with exactly the product that we thought of two or three years ago and goes on to make millions and millions of dollars the difficulty with our creativity is not that we do not have the same insights as the geniuses but it's this one small distinction the geniuses trust and believe in the value of their insights and in the value of the thoughts and the ideas that come to them, whereas we do not. We th think of these ideas and we think, well, th this idea can't be of any use. It, only, it came from me. It's my idea. And so we wait until see somebody else come up with the idea, which may not even be as good as the idea we originally had, and we say, isn't that person intelligent? Look what a wonderful idea they've come up with. Well, many of us think that our creativity is limited by our IQ, that our creativity is limited by the years of education we had or the grades that we got in school, that somehow creativity is something that only scientists and artists and musicians and painters have or poets or writers. The fact of the matter is that creativity is a very simple concept. And to boil it down to its simplest words is that all creativity is simply a way of improving on the existing way of doing things. Every creativity is an improvement, and to the degree to which we have the ability to find ways to improve the way that we do things in any area, we are creative individuals. And the more we use our creativity, like the more we use a muscle, the more of it we have. Another characteristic of this superconscious capability, or this superconscious mind, is that it has access, when it computes for us, it has access to all data stored in our subconscious mind, and it has the ability to discriminate between valid and invalid data. In other words, when we program a goal or a problem into our subconscious minds and ask the subconscious mind to solve it for us, the subconscious mind passes it on to the superconscious capability. The superconscious capability, when it computes and calculates to solve the problem or give us ideas to help us move toward our goal, has the ability to take all of the data that we have taken in in the course of our lifetime and stored in the subconscious mind and sort out from that data what is valid and what is true and discard the rest 
when it computes. That's why whenever you get an idea, whenever you get one of these flashes that come into your mind that answers a question perfectly, you will find that in every single case the answer is correct in every detail. Another characteristic of this superconscious capability is that it brings us ideas that lie outside of our own individual experience. Often we will get ideas that are totally new and that come totally from outside the experience, the education, the knowledge that we've had in the past. This is why most of the great breakthroughs in science and technology today are coming from small corporations, individuals working in private research laboratories. Very few of the major breakthroughs come from the big companies. The big companies will take the major breakthroughs and develop them and commercialize them, but almost invariably, these major breakthroughs are coming from people sometimes who have not even been in the field before, but they get ideas and insights into doing things in a new or different way that are completely unique and original and that lead to the opening up of entire new industries. It reminds me of a story of a small boy who came to the scene of an accident. The police had cordoned off the road and a bridge where a truck driving at 40 or 50 miles an hour had tried to drive under the bridge and become stuck underneath the bridge. And the traffic was cordoned off and there were several tow trucks trying to pull the truck out from under the bridge. And the little boy came to the edge of the crowd and he asked the policeman, he said, what's going on? And the policeman said, well, the truck is stuck under the bridge. He said, what are they doing? He said, they're trying to pull it out. And they just weren't able to pull it out. The truck was too solidly jammed under the bridge. So the little boy looked past the policeman and looked up at him and said, why don't they let the air out of the tires? And the policeman looked down at him, and he looked back at all those grown men trying to pull this truck out from under the bridge, and he shook his head and went back down the hill. And that's exactly what they did. They let the air out of the tires, and the truck just backed out as easy as pie. The little boy had the ability to see things from a different perspective, and every single one of us has that capability. The superconscious mind is the source of all creativity, all intuition, all flashes of insight, all hunches. The superconscious mind is the source of inspiration and motivation and the ability to see things in a brand new way. The superconscious mind is the source of new ideas that help us move toward goal attainment. And the superconscious mind is available to each one of us like a power source that we can plug into simply by finding the plug. Another characteristic of the superconscious mind is that it functions on a non-conscious level 24 hours per day. It is always working to resolve the problems that we are mulling over and to move us toward achieving the goals that we have programmed into the subconscious. Another characteristic of the superconscious is that it's capable of goal-oriented motivation. For goal-oriented motivation, it requires clear, specific goals. Now, you can imagine using the superconscious capability, imagine that you had an enormous computer, the most complex computer, the most sophisticated computer ever built in the universe, and you had an entire team of the most accomplished computer experts that had ever been trained and they were at your service and you could go to them with any problem or any goal and they could put it into the computer and they could give you the answer or they could give you the ideas that you would need to achieve the goal nonetheless even with the most sophisticated computer and the most intelligent computer operators there is nothing that they could do if you could not define the problem for them or if you could not clearly tell them what it is that you wanted to accomplish. This is why we talked before about how important it is to have a very clear, specific idea of the goals that we want to accomplish. The superconscious mind is invariably triggered by clarity of definition and by decisiveness. The more decisive and clear we are about what we want, what we want to accomplish, what problems we want to resolve, the more rapidly the superconscious capability goes to work to bring the answers into our lives. Another characteristic of the superconscious mind in terms of goal-oriented motivation is that it releases ideas and energy for goal attainment. If ever you've had the experience of working on something that you are really excited about, that you are really emotionally involved in, something that you really wanted or something that really inspired you, you will remember that at that point you seem to have a continuous flow of ideas and energy. You seem to be bubbling with energy. Sometimes you could go on only four or five hours sleep a night. Sometimes your mind would just crackle with ideas and you had this feeling of continuous excitement like sometimes you could barely sleep this is an example of superconscious energy it releases free energy from the atmosphere and makes it available to us to enable us to move toward goal attainment and we'll explain that a little bit more as we go along 
Another characteristic of the superconscious is that it responds to clear authoritative commands. And the clear authoritative commands we give to our superconscious capability are in the form of positive affirmations. Every time we affirm positively from the conscious mind to the subconscious mind, we trigger the superconscious mind into action. That's why whenever we say, I like myself, I like myself, I feel terrific, I feel terrific, I earn $50,000 a year, I earn $50,000 a year, these strong emotionalized affirmations drive down into the subconscious and trigger the superconscious into action. That's why we find that men and women who are continually talking and thinking in an excited, positive way about the goals that they want to accomplish seem to have a continuous stream of energy, enthusiasm, and ideas that move them toward the accomplishment of those goals. In the Bible it says, To him who hath shall more be given, to him who hath not, even that which he hath shall be taken away. And it means that to those who are excited and positive and moving toward the accomplishment of their goals, they get even more energy and more ideas and more creativity. To those who are going nowhere, who have very few ideas or have no goals, even that energy that they have is drained away and they become tired and depressed and fatigued. Another characteristic of the superconscious mind is that it automatically and continuously solves every problem on the pathway to your goal. No matter how far the goal is, no matter how distant, as long as the goal is clear, the superconscious will give you every single idea and solution that you need in the exact order that you need it. That once you have programmed the goal in and take the first step, you will find that the superconscious will give you the first step to take, it will solve the first problem, and when you implement the solution, it will give you the next step, it will solve the next problem, it will give you the following step, it will solve the following problem, and all you have to do is take it one step at a time, and at every step along the way, as long as the goal is clear, the problem will come to you. Another characteristic of the superconscious is that it operates best in a spirit of faith and acceptance, which means that the harder you don't try, the more rapidly the superconscious brings you the ideas and the solutions that you require to achieve the goals that you've programmed into the subconscious. In all creative work, mental effort defeats itself. Creativity cannot be forced. Creativity invariably favors the relaxed mind. When we talked in mental programming about how important it is to relax, to take a deep breath, to get a clear mental picture of what you want to accomplish, and just absolutely believe with complete confidence that if you can keep that clear mental picture, that it will come to you exactly when you are ready for it. This superconscious capability, the more you believe in it, the more you absolutely trust that you are moving in the direction of your goal and that your goal is moving toward you simultaneously, the more rapidly it seems to work. The harder you try to force it, the less effective it is. In the Bible, again, it says, Whatsoever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye have it, and you will have it. This is one of the most powerful admonitions to self-confidence and to positive thinking, that if you absolutely believe that you already have the goal as achieved, and just confidently expect each step to take care of itself, that's what triggers the superconscious into working. Another capacity is that the superconscious grows in capability as it is used and believed in. The more that we absolutely believe that it is working for us, the more rapidly it works. And you'll find a very interesting thing, that when you begin using this superconscious capability, it's the same as getting a muscle into shape. If you have not done physical exercise for a period of time, it'll take a while before you limber up and loosen up and are able to use your muscles in a particular sport. When you have warmed up and when you have gotten yourself into good physical condition you find that you can play longer you can engage in the sport for hours without fatigue that you can do more and more with greater and greater flexibility and adaptability it's the same way with the superconscious capability the more you use it the faster it works and the better it works until it finally gets to the point where you can think of a goal or put a problem into the superconscious and you'll get a response sometimes within minutes sometimes so fast that it will absolutely stagger you. By the way, Dr. Joyce Brothers calls this flow of superconscious creativity just by the words flow. And whenever an individual has been working on a creative project, and many people who have to write proposals or write reports or write term papers have had the experience of sitting down to work at a term paper or to work on a proposal, and suddenly something clicks in their mind, 
and the words begin to flow, and they begin to flow line after line after line and page after page, and it seems that you can write the whole proposal from beginning to end almost without notes, and when you're finished, it's word perfect. Many of the great poems and the great stories and the great songs, many of the great creations of human history have been written or constructed word perfect the very first time. And this is all an example of this superconscious capability that's available to all of us. Another capability of the superconscious mind is that it has the ability to take us through the lessons that we need to learn in order to achieve the goal. We know, for instance, that the subconscious mind will take a goal and will go to work to move us toward that goal, very much the way a torpedo, once it is aimed at a particular target and fired, the torpedo will move toward the target, will take sonar blips from the target that feed back to it, and will correct its course, and no matter where the target goes, the torpedo will hit the target. The superconscious will do this also, but the superconscious has one additional unique capacity, and it is this. We can program our goal or target into our mind, into our superconscious capability, and as long as we have a very clear idea of what it is we want to accomplish, we can then fire off our mental torpedo into the air, and the superconscious has the ability to seek out and find the target, even though we have no idea where it is when we begin moving toward it. While we are moving toward this target, the superconscious, especially if we have set a goal or target that is very high for us, the superconscious will take us through the lessons necessary to enable us to accomplish that goal. It will take us over hurdles. It will take us through mistakes, through obstacles, through setbacks, through disappointments, through stumbling blocks, if you like, every one of which has been put there to teach us a valuable lesson to enable us to reach our ultimate goal. We've all had the experience of having unfortunate or unhappy things happen to us in our lives. And then later, in retrospect, we look back and we say, boy, wasn't it fortunate that that happened at that time? Because if that hadn't happened, this wouldn't have happened, and this wouldn't have happened, and we wouldn't have arrived here, which is where we wanted to end up in the first place. Have you had that experience? It's a very normal experience that we look back in retrospect on unfortunate occurrences and we say, boy, it was lucky that happened. Because if it hadn't happened, I wouldn't have achieved the happiness or the success that I've achieved today. On the David Susskind show a few years ago, they had four young men who had earned a million dollars before the age of 35. And in talking to these young men, they asked them how many different careers or businesses they had been in before they had reached the business that enabled them to become financially independent at a young age. And it turned out that they had each been in an average of 18 businesses before they reached the one that enabled them to be financially successful. Now the logical question is this, did they fail in 17 businesses? Because that's what happened, they went in and out of 17 businesses or careers before they found the 18th one. What was the purpose of each of those 17 businesses on average? Wasn't it to teach them the essential lessons that they had to learn if they wanted to become millionaires in their mid-thirties? Of course. Now, the difference between winners and losers is simply this, is that winners accept and believe absolutely that they are fated and destined to be successful, and that every single thing that happens between where they start and their ultimate success is either a step forward or a valuable lesson that has been sent to them to teach them something that will enable them to be ultimately successful. The losers set off with sometimes high goals and high ambitions, but whenever they reach disappointments and setbacks, they quit or they deviate or they scrap their goals or they settle for something far, far less. The winners take every single challenge, every single hurdle, every single difficulty and say, all right, this has been sent to teach me something really valuable. This is part of the process that prepares me and equips me for achieving my ultimate goal. So what can I learn from it? And that's the distinct difference. And if you absolutely believe that you are fated to be successful, then just simply confidently expect that every single thing that happens to you is happening to you for your benefit. It is up to you to find the benefit that's hidden within it. And again, Napoleon Hill who calls the superconscious mind the infinite intelligence in his writing, simply said that within every setback or obstacle or disadvantage, there is the seed of an equal or opposite or greater advantage or benefit. And that the successful man or woman always looks for the advantage or benefit in every situation. And lo and behold, 
they always find it. Because as long as you're looking for the obstacle or benefit, you cannot be seen or worrying about the negative event or the setback. The next characteristic of the superconscious mind, which is terribly important to us, is that it makes all of our words and actions and their effects fit a pattern consistent with our self-concepts, with our current programming, and with the goals that we are trying to accomplish. What this means is that when we have a very clear idea of what it is that we want to achieve, especially in a social or business situation, the superconscious mind will make everything that we say and everything that we do exactly appropriate to what we're trying to accomplish. Flip Wilson used to say that when you're hot, you're hot, and when you're not, you're not. And we've all had the experience of being in a situation where we simply couldn't say or do the wrong thing. It seemed that everything that came out of our mouth or everything that we did was exactly right for the situation. And it felt perfect and it flowed naturally and it was all in complete harmony with the goal or the objective that we wish to attain. We've all had that experience. Psychologists who have a great difficulty dealing with this idea of superconscious creativity because it cannot be duplicated in the laboratory have two expressions for it. One is called serendipity. Serendipity is considered to be the ability to find happy events, to go through life and find series of happy coincidences that occur to one. And another expression that they use is what is called synchronicity when several events conspire together seemingly totally unrelated and yet when they meet together they form a pattern or bring us the result or a solution that we were looking for and we've all had the occasion where a whole series of things seem to conspire together into a happy coincidence where a series of events conspire together to bring us the goal to bring us the solution to bring us the thing that we were looking for this synchronicity or serendipitous series of events is simply another functioning of the superconscious mind. Another factor in superconscious functioning is that the superconscious mind functions best under two conditions. It functions best when the conscious mind is working with 100 percent concentration on solving the problem or achieving the goal. Very often when we are totally concentrated on accomplishing one specific important thing, the ideas that we need will flash into our minds. The other time that the superconscious mind works is when the conscious mind is completely elsewhere, when we are thinking of something else totally separate and apart from the problem or the goal that we're working on. Very often we'll be driving along or going for a walk or listening to a piece of music or even in the middle of a conversation, the idea or the answer that we have been searching for will shoot into our mind with crystal clarity. The superconscious mind does not function when we are mulling over our problems or our goals. The superconscious mind only works when we are concentrating totally or when we're not thinking about it at all. So it is a very good idea to try both on every problem, to try both on every goal, and I'll give you some methods to do that in a couple of minutes. The superconscious mind also contains all monitor circuits, which means that we can use the superconscious for pre-programming. Many people have the ability to wake up in the morning without an alarm clock. This is an ability that everybody has. They can program their mind to wake up within one minute of a particular time, whether it's in a pitch black room, whether they've gone to bed early or late, whether they have crossed time zones, and every single time their mind goes off like a little alarm clock and wakes them at exactly the precise moment that they've programmed into it. As a matter of fact, nobody needs alarm clocks. The only reason we use alarm clocks is because we doubt the superconscious capability. Has anybody ever wondered why this works? Thousands of people don't use alarm clocks, but they very seldom sit down and say, well, why is this? Why is it that it's possible to program this time so clearly into my mind and wake up within a minute of that time? Another way that you can use this superconscious capability is in getting parking spots. Many people can get parking spots 20 out of 20 times on crowded city streets. My wife, for instance, has a series of things that she does in a given day, banks that she visits and stores and so on, because we have two small children. It's not convenient to park way out in the parking lot or a long way from the entrance to these stores or shopping centers, so she has a particular parking stall in front of each place that she's going to, which she visualizes. And even on a very busy day, when she arrives there, somebody is holding the parking stall for her, and just as she arrives, not one car earlier, not one car later, the person who's holding the parking stall backs out and drives away. Anybody can use this to get parking stalls. I personally can get two parking stalls on a downtown street in any city in North America. 
You can develop it to the capability where you can win bets on it. All you do is clearly visualize a parking stall in front of the building where you want to park, and you will find that each time that you arrive there, to the degree to which you absolutely believe it will be there, the parking stall will be there. And I've had thousands of people tell me that they've been doing this for years, and their friends are just so outraged and irritated because they can do it every single time. And they absolutely believe, and this is very, very important, the degree of belief and confidence that we have in this superconscious functioning is the exact degree to which it functions. If our belief is total, the superconscious mind functions totally and continuously. If our belief is half, then it functions half the time. If our belief is 10%, it only functions 10% of the time. It's totally controlled by our own minds. With regard to pre-programming the computer, you can remind yourself to make a phone call at a certain time. You can remind yourself to take something from home to the office or from work to home. You can remind yourself to drop off something or pick up something. You can program it in and just tell the superconscious to remind you at exactly the right moment. And at exactly the right moment, just as you're passing the item or passing the telephone or passing the store, the idea will shoot into your brain to remind you to pick it up, make the phone call, drop it off, or whatever it happens to be. The superconscious mind has its own separate computer, which will bring you exactly the answer that you require to solve your problem or achieve your goal at exactly the right time for you. The superconscious mind knows the time better than you do. And the most important thing you can do is that when the answer comes to you, you must act on it immediately. You must immediately implement the intuition or the flash of insight or the idea or the answer that comes to you. Many times we've had the occasion where we've been working on a problem or a goal and we've gotten an idea of something to do and we've said, oh, I'll do that tomorrow or I'll get on that first thing in the morning or that's a good idea but I'll start on it on Monday. And when we start on it on Monday, we find that it's too late. That when we call the person or we do the thing, we find that the person says, geez, I wish you'd called me last week because I had exactly the solution that you required. So when you have programmed a goal into the superconscious mind and you get an intuitive flash or an idea of what to do to move yourself toward the goal, it's absolutely essential that you act on it immediately, without hesitation, pick up the phone, develop that sense of urgency, and move on it quickly. Sometimes it is only seconds or minutes away from being too soon or too late. And when you get those golden gems of superconscious insight, it's very important that you act instantly. And the more rapidly you act on those insights, the more insights that you'll get. And I've seen businessmen who have no other competence or ability at all except an ability to trust to the superconscious capability and to act instantaneously every single time they get an answer, build enormous fortunes and become in outrageously successful, irrespective of lack of education, lack of intelligence, lack of any other ability, lack of any benefits or advantages, by simply plugging into the superconscious capability, they've gotten all the answers that they required to build enormous companies. Finally, the basic operating principle of the superconscious mind is this. Any thought, plan, goal, or idea held continuously in the conscious mind must be brought into reality by the superconscious mind. Any thought, plan, or goal held continuously in the conscious mind must be brought into our lives and into our experience and into our reality by the superconscious mind, whether positive or negative. And this is why it is so extremely important for us to always keep our mind focused on what we want to happen and to talk and think and visualize and imagine only that which we desire to come into our lives. Because our lives are nothing more than the outpicturing or expression of our continuous conscious thoughts. And you'll find that in the experience of every successful man or woman who has ever lived, that they have sooner or later developed the habit of keeping their mind rigorously disciplined and focused on what they want to happen rather than on what they fear. Because if we think continuously about what we fear, if we think continuously about what we don't want to happen, we bring that into our lives by the same irrevocable, immutable law that we bring good things into our lives. So we must 
consciously and deliberately and systematically exclude all thoughts from our conscious mind that we do not want to bring into our reality. We must not talk about the things we fear. We must not think about them. We must not write about them. We must not dwell upon them or read about them. We must only think of what we want to happen because we are dealing with the most powerful single force in nature, your own individual human brain, which can tap into this superconscious power source and bring us anything that we want in life. Any thought, plan, goal, or idea held continuously in your conscious mind must be brought into reality by the superconscious. The only question is, do you have the discipline and the control and the perseverance and the persistence and the determination to hold your goal, your ambition, your aspiration clearly in your mind long enough for it to come into reality? That's the only thing that you have to do, and everything else will take care of itself by immutable law. This is the most important encapsulation of the laws of success that you will ever hear. In this session, we're going to talk about programming your mind for success. We know from the earlier sessions that we become what we think about and that everything that we are right now, this moment today, is the sum total result of everything that we have thought to this period. We also know that everything we are or ever will become will come as a result of the content of our minds, that we do not achieve our destinies or realize our futures through physical effort at all. It's always through what we do with our minds. And that everything that we do to improve the quality of our thinking must, by extension, improve the quality of our lives. So let's just briefly recap some of the mental laws that we have talked about up to now and then mention two more plus two factors which are critically important to reprogramming our minds. The first law was the law of belief that simply said that whatever we believe with feeling becomes our reality. That if we wish to change our realities, we must change our beliefs about ourselves in relation to reality. That if we have self-limiting beliefs, they come true for us irrespective of whether or not they are based on fact or fiction. The second law that we talked about was the law of expectation that says whatever we expect with confidence becomes our own self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's why it is absolutely essential that we continually expect the best of ourselves and expect the best of every situation. We find that the most successful men and women make a habit of developing positive self-expectancy. They are continually manufacturing their own expectations to keep themselves positive and to keep their self-fulfilling prophecies consistent with what they want to accomplish rather than with what they fear. The third law that we talked about is the law of attraction that says that we inevitably attract into our lives the people and circumstances that harmonize with our dominant thoughts. And that if we want to attract different people and different circumstances, we have to change our thinking. That our thoughts are like a form of electromagnetic energy that radiate out from us and that attract back to us like a magnet those people and those circumstances that harmonize with them. The third law that we talked about is the law of concentration. Now, concentration is extremely important. It says that whatever you dwell upon in the conscious mind grows in your experience. It's as though your thoughts were watered and fertilized by continual concentration. If you want to grow a plant, it requires fertilizer, water, and nutrition, and weeding. If you want to grow something in your life, it requires concentrating on that thought or picture until it comes into your reality. The next law that we talked about is the law of substitution, which says that the conscious mind can only hold one thought at a time, either positive or negative. If we wish to have positive experiences in our lives, we have to keep our conscious mind focused on positive things, positive events, positive circumstances. In James Allen's wonderful book, As a Man Thinketh, he says that the mind is very much like a garden, and like a garden, either weeds or flowers will grow. But if you do not deliberately and consciously and purposefully plant flowers, weeds will grow automatically. Weeds do not need any encouragement. Weeds do not need any nutrition. They do not need any fertilizer. They do not even need weeding, if you like. Weeds just grow automatically, which is to say that our minds will tend to be occupied 
with worries and fears and anxieties unless we consciously and deliberately fill them with thoughts. Like a vacuum, the mind will not remain empty for any period of time unless we consciously fill them with thoughts consistent with the people that we want to be, with the characteristics and attributes that we want to have, then what we'll have is weeds. And the reason why most people are so unhappy in life is that their minds are full of weeds. It's as simple as that. The two factors that are important are thought and feeling. Feeling is, if you like, the activating process of mind. That each thought that we wish to bring into our reality must be charged or activated by an emotion. An emotion of desire, an emotion of love, an emotion of excitement. But a thought without a feeling does not generate a reaction in our lives. A feeling without a thought does not generate a direction. So thought and feeling must be mixed. The next law is what we call the law of practice or the law of repetition. We know that if we wish to develop a motor skill or a mechanical skill, if we wish to learn how to type or to play tennis or to ski or to do anything that requires our physical body, in order to do it we have to first learn the skill and then we have to practice it over and over and over again until it becomes automatic. Every single attitude or thought or value that we have is a habit pattern of thought, either positive or negative. And if we wish to change from negative habit patterns to positive habit patterns, we have to practice the positive ones over and over again. If we wish to see ourselves and think about ourselves as positive, constructive, achievement-oriented, forward-looking individuals, we have to think about ourselves and dwell on ourselves as being that type of person all the time. By doing that over and over again, that's how we practice until it becomes a habit. Positive people do not have to remind themselves to be positive when they get up in the morning. Positive people are positive because they have thought positively for so long, it's a natural habit for them to be positive. It's a habit for them to be optimistic. It's a habit for them to look for the good in each situation. It's a habit for them to respond positively to other people. They don't have to make any effort. They have done it over and over again until it is an automatic response. And our entire future is dependent upon the habits we form, especially the habit patterns of mind. As they say, form good habits and make them your masters. And finally, the law of relaxation. The law of relaxation says quite simply that in all mental working, effort defeats itself. Now, in physical working, if we wish to chop a piece of wood or hammer a nail into a block of wood, the harder we hit the faster we chop the wood, the faster we drive the nail in. So we know that in the physical world, the more exertion we put in, the harder we work, the more we put our shoulder to it, the better results we get. In the mental world, though, it is exactly the opposite, and this is an absolutely critical distinction. It is the harder that we don't try, the faster our minds change and we become the people that we want to become. The more we just relax and confidently believe and expect that the things that we want will come into our life when we are ready for them, the more rapidly they come in. The harder we work, the farther we push, the less success we have. And if we try to make things happen out of their due time, invariably we precipitate a crisis in our lives. If we try to make things happen too fast or too slow, especially in mental working, we will cause enormous stress and chaos in our lives. So the answer is just to relax, to confidently believe, to think about, to concentrate on what we want to happen, to keep our minds focused on where we want to go, and just confidently expect that exactly when we are ready, what we want will come to us. In this session, we're going to talk about the process of changing our thoughts, the different things that we can do to change our thoughts and our habit patterns, our mental habit patterns, from negative to positive. We know that we always earn a living in a manner consistent with our self-concept. We know that we always behave in a manner consistent with our self-concept. We know that all of our performance is linked to our self-concept up to this moment. We also know, wonderfully enough, that every human being is in a continual state of becoming. As a matter of fact, there is a sub-branch of psychology called the psychology of becoming. The psychology of becoming simply says that nobody stays the same for any period of time. We're continually evolving and growing as human beings and becoming more and better and different. And that we are always changing in the direction of our ideal self. We are always changing in the direction of our dominant thoughts 
and our dominant goals. Our job in this process is to keep very clearly in our minds the people we would like to be and the goals we would like to accomplish. And as we do that, we begin to move irrevocably toward them, just like a rocket ship moves toward a distant star and then becomes attracted by the gravity of that star and moves faster and faster on the way toward it. There are two habits of mind which we must carefully avoid if we are going to continue to grow and evolve toward the full development of our potential. And the first is what is called homeostasis. Homeostasis is the condition of clinging to the status quo. It's the unwillingness to let go of the past. It's the desire to keep things exactly the way they are. Because we know that the whole idea of change is scary, and many people, rather than allowing themselves to go with the flow and to change and evolve and grow and become more fulfilled human beings and hold back the future and keep their minds rigidly fixed on what they are and where they are today and not advance at all. So in order to change our self-concept, one of the first things that we learn is that we must be willing to let go of the old person and to become the new person and to make efforts in that direction. The second malady that we must avoid is what is called psychosclerosis. Psychosclerosis is a hardening of the attitudes. Psychosclerosis is a case that sets in when we become rigid in our thinking. We become inflexible and we become dogmatic and we will not allow any kind of a change into our lives. We again dig in our heels mentally and we try to hold back the tide. These two, psychosclerosis and homeostasis, or what is called the homeostatic impulse, the refusal to change, hold us back but all they do is they hold us in our rigid older selves and they prohibit our growth. In order to continue growing, we have to let go. We have to decide to change our minds by developing new habit patterns of thinking about ourselves. Developing new habit patterns of thought is not that difficult. It only takes something like 10... of how we would be and how we would behave with the new characteristics and attributes. If, for instance, we want to be more patient and kind and loving with our families, then we get a very clear picture of ourselves as patient and kind and loving. And we see that picture and we use that as our directional mechanism or our source of direction, a homing beam that we focus in on and try to keep in a straight line with. Also, if, for instance, we want to develop leadership ability, or we want to develop the ability to make decisions, or we want to develop greater self-confidence, then we begin to think about ourselves as though we already had those qualities and characteristics. We begin to look at other people and think of other people who have those qualities and characteristics and see us acting that way. As we begin to do that, we begin to change our self-image by replacing the picture that we have in our mind of the individual with a negative habit pattern new habit patterns of thought by continually thinking of ourselves in terms of the new characteristics the new qualities the new abilities and no longer thinking of ourselves as having the limited qualities and the limited characteristics there are three methods that we can use to accelerate this process of personal development the first is what is called affirmation and using affirmations positive present tense, personal affirmations, our potential is literally unlimited. Affirmations are positive, assertive statements that say yes to our potential. And the affirmations that we've talked about up to now are affirmations like, I like myself, I am responsible, I feel terrific, I am decisive. Conscious, which brings us to an additional law which is called the law of subconscious activity. And the law of subconscious activity simply says that whatever the conscious mind believes and accepts, the subconscious mind immediately goes to work to bring into our physical reality. The subconscious mind is a mechanical agent that acts and obeys our instructions, and our instructions are always the content of our conscious mind. 
Clint Eastwood starred in a movie called Firefox. It was quite a remarkable picture, and the plot of the movie was that the Russians had developed a supersonic jet fighter that was so advanced that it could be controlled by the thoughts of the pilot. And the pilot could think the plane up or down or sideways. It could think the plane into firing or discharging or taking evasive action. And at the critical moment in the movie, Clint Eastwood has to remember to think in Russian because the plane is programmed only to receive thoughts in Russian. Now, when we think of a technological marvel like that, we know that it is only the stuff of science fiction, that it'll never be possible for a person to use simple thought power to direct a supersonic plane or any technological marvel. Yet, we are exactly the same way in that our lives are directed either up or down or sideways or in any direction by the content and the quality of our thoughts on an ongoing basis. That whatever we think in our mind, we begin immediately to move our mind toward. It's the same as when you are sitting driving down the street in an automobile with your hands on the wheel. If you turn the wheel sharply to the right or the left, you'll go to the right or the left. If you are driving through your life, as you turn your thoughts sharply to the right or the left, your life and your experiences will tend to go in that direction also. Our thoughts have inordinate power, and not only that, our thoughts have a powerful impact on the people around us for ways and reasons that we simply do not understand yet, but our thoughts have a kind of magnetic energy that actually causes changes in the behavior and the performance of other people around us. So thoughts are things, if you like. Thoughts are very, very powerful. Using affirmations, and you can create affirmations for anything that you want to accomplish. Using affirmations means our future is absolutely unlimited. And so what we have to do is we have to keep talking to ourselves. If we want to increase our income, we have to keep talking to ourselves as though we had that income already. We have to keep saying, I have, or I earned $30,000 a year. I earned $30,000 a year. Affirmations, in order to be accepted by the subconscious, have to be couched in the three Ps. First of all, they have to be personal. It has to be I. We cannot say you or somebody else. We always have to talk in the first person singular. I like myself. Second of all, they have to be positive. If we wish to quit smoking, we would not say... I am a non-smoker. We wouldn't say, I don't eat desserts anymore, I don't eat desserts anymore. What we would say is, I only eat foods that are healthy and consistent with a slim, trim figure. The third P is that, that it must be in the present tense. We cannot say, I will earn X number of dollars next year, or I will lose X number of pounds over the next 90 days, because the subconscious cannot relate to information that is couched in any other tense but the now. So every affirmation that we make and every clear statement that we make to ourselves has to be in the present. I do, I am, I have, I achieve, I earn, and it has to be present and it has to be personal. With regard to affirmations, when we write out our goals and rewrite our goals, we also write them as though they existed right now. We write most powerful single capability that the human being has and it is the ability to form a clear precise vivid mental picture of the things that we want to be have or do and to hold that picture very very clearly in our minds whatever you can hold in your mind on a continuous basis you can be have or do whatever you can picture in your imagination you can accomplish Napoleon Hill said many years ago, whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. And even Einstein said that your imagination is your preview of life's coming attractions. And we have taught people to use visualization to heal sick bodies, to achieve higher levels of income, to achieve promotions, to develop new habit patterns of self-confidence and personal power and enthusiasm. The key to using visualization is to get a clear mental picture of yourself as though you already had the characteristics and attributes that you want. Prior to every situation of importance, take a couple of minutes to play a clear mental picture of the ideal you in the upcoming situation. 
If you're going into a sales interview, if you are going in to see your boss, if you are holding a party, if you are giving a talk, anything that requires mental preparation that you want to be at your very best at, stop for a few seconds and even a few minutes prior to the situation and form a clear mental picture of yourself performing at your very best in that situation and then see the ideal result in your mind's eye. See a clear, precise picture of the situation coming out exactly the way you wanted it to come out. Exactly the ideal result. The most valuable commodity I know of is information. Wouldn't you agree?